DNA is special in that it really can start to tell us about the evolutionary dynamics of organisms. And this is absolutely critical in trying to figure out what we can do today to protect species and ecosystems from the potentially devastating consequences of projected climate change. Well, here we are at UC Santa Cruz, set in a beautiful coastal redwood forest. You know, these sequoias are an ancient family of trees. They saw dinosaurs come and go. They even predate flowers and even grasses. And they survived the ice ages. <laughs> that's right. And that's why we're here today, to meet Beth Shapiro. They're using genomics to see the impacts of climate change. On not only plants, but also animal populations. You're right. Let's go to the lab and see what she's up to. So how do you collect all these samples? Do you have a lot of collaborations with other labs? We collaborate with other labs and with paleontologists who work in the field and also with people from different museums around the world. How do you get the DNA from these samples? So after we've gone up into the Arctic or into a museum collection and we've picked out the bones that we want to process, we will take a very small fragment of these bones back into our clean lab where we would grind it into a fine powder and extract the DNA and then prepare it into a sequencing library, and then bring it over and then stick it on the machine and hit the button. How do you deal with sample contamination? There are two types of contamination that we have to deal with. So if I were to extract DNA from this horse bone, I would get a whole bunch of DNA that belongs to this horse, but also DNA that belonged to any of the environmental microbes or fungi that colonized this bone while it was buried in the soil. The second type of DNA is more insidious, and that is just that DNA is everywhere. Me, by touching this bone, I'm depositing my own DNA into this bone. Do you also work with other fossils? We can get DNA from pretty much any organism that was alive, as long as the DNA is not too decayed. We can actually understand how the trees were changing and how this in turn was shaping the changes that we're seeing in horses. What we're really seeing is that populations become isolated from one, one another in these tiny little refugia. It's this rapid fragmentation that's caused by these rapid periods of climate change that seems to be most important in determining whether a species is likely to go extinct or not. We were able to recover a bone a few years ago from the Yukon that we think is around 700,000 years old. We were able to recover enough information to piece together the entire horse genome from that 700,000 year old horse. What's your favorite extinct animal? Some of my favorite are the largest ones. There was a giant hypercarnivorous bear called Arctodus with a short face bear. And he was pretty scary. There was also a giant beaver. So as you can see, this is a very, very large example of something that today is quite a lot smaller. People have found pieces of wood that have the tooth marks from being gnawed by these giant beavers, which is one of the ways that we know that they were such incredible ecosystem engineers. What inspires you about this work? I get to go up in the Arctic and dig up bones like this. <laughs> <laughs> It's like being a DNA explorer. It's telling us about us, about our history, about the history of animals that we still live with and work with today. This is around 35,000 years ago, and this area right here, which we call Beringia, was actually a very rich and productive grassland that was home to lots of different species. And this land bridge was an important conduit for exchange between Asia and North America. And then as it started to get colder, as the ice age, which peaked around 20,000 years ago, progressed, we saw the expansion of glaciers. And what this did, really importantly, is cut off gene flow between populations up here in Beringia and down here in the central and southern part of North America. For 10, maybe even 15,000 years, these populations were separated and genetically they began to diverge from each other. And then as the Ice Age ended, we saw these glaciers start to separate from each other and form what's commonly known as the Ice-Free Corridor. And it's thought that a lot of species, including humans, used this Ice-Free Corridor as a means to go from one place to another. So after thousands of years of isolation, fragmentation, all of a sudden these populations were once again able to mix. Many of the species that we studied went extinct in Beringia, 
bison, for example, and horses much earlier than they did in the central part of North America. And we're really just beginning to understand why that might have been. What can we learn from your work to plan for the future? What we're really hoping to be able to learn by gathering these bones and other types of environmental data that go back through time in the permafrost is how species in the past responded to past periods of rapid climate change. For us, the focus really is the last ice age, the transition from the coldest part of the last ice age into the warm interglacial period that we're in today. We want to know, using DNA extracted from these remains, how species and populations and communities grew or shrank or moved in different areas as a response to this period of rapid climate warming because we'd really like to be able to make more informed decisions about how to protect living species in the face of projected climate change. It's amazing how climate change really can separate and isolate these populations. And that puts them under immense pressure and sets them on the path to extinction. You know, that's true. And hopefully genomics will tell us how climate change is going to impact our futures. <laughs>